There we go. All live. All right. So we're saying good afternoon and welcome to Ask the Experts, a conversation hosted by SCAD Alliance. We're going to give just a few minutes for people to get logged on. And as people are getting logged on, if you're in on Zoom or Facebook, then you already see us. Um, but just so you know, we're are on Zoom and then also streaming live over to Facebook. Um, and just so everybody knows too, we are recording the webinar. So if you're unable to stay for the whole hour or um, if you wanna watch it again, you can find it on our website or our YouTube channel. I'm gonna give just another minute or two as people get logged in and then we'll get started. All right, well, let's go ahead and get started. Um, good afternoon and welcome to Ask the Experts, a conversation hosted by SCAD Alliance. Today we're discussing SCAD and related vascular problems, including fibromuscular dysplasia or FMD. I'm Rebecca Freeman and I'll be moderating and leading our conversation today. I am a board member of SCAD Alliance and a two-time SCAD survivor. If you're new to SCAD Alliance, we are a nonprofit organization founded by survivors in partnership with leading cardiologists and health advocates to advance the science of SCAD. One of our main goals is to support patients and families, and as part of that, we've developed this monthly webinar series, Ask the Experts. We hope to offer support and education to survivors and caregivers by engaging in conversations with experts on SCAD-related topics each month. So today we're talking about SCAD and related vascular conditions. We received so many wonderful questions for the talk today. We're really excited that you all are also excited about these discussions. We pulled out the questions specific to vascular conditions in FMD. Our panelists will include some in their discussion and we'll get to as many as possible at the end. But also please be sure to check out our past webinars on genetics, PTSD, exercise, and emergency room care. They're linked on our Facebook and our YouTube and website. And also any questions that haven't been addressed yet, we are using to shape future webinars. So know that we've heard all these questions and we're excited to get talking today. The one thing I wanna start with is to make sure that we preface by saying there's not a ton of data on SCAD that is gold standard randomized clinical trials to give concrete data. So just please remember that everything presented today is based on the opinion and the extensive experience and clinical practice of these clinicians. You're able to give us a great overview and guidance, but please remember that specifics for each individual really do need to be developed with your own providers. Um, however, there is hope for more answers. SCAD Alliance is, um, has organized a ISCAD registry and we are enrolling um, patients across the country Currently, we have over 400 patients in the first year and a half, so we're well on our way to our goal of 1,000 patients, um, in which we'll have a lot more um, patient data to be able to study this. So without further ado, I want to go ahead and introduce our panelists. So say you have Dr. Esther Kim. I'm gonna wave. Dr. Kim is a cardiologist and vascular medicine specialist with an interest in uncommon arterial disorders, including spontaneous coronary artery dissection and fibromuscular dysplasia. She's director of the Arteriopathy Clinic at Vanderbilt Hospital and Vascular Institute and strives to provide comprehensive multidisciplinary care to patients with complex arterial diseases. Dr. Kim is the SCAD Alliance Scientific Advisory Board Chair, National Principal Investigator of the ISCAD Registry and ISCAD Steering Committee Chair. We are glad to have you. That's Dr. Daniela Kadian Dodov. She's an assistant professor of medicine at the Aiken School of Medicine at Mount Sinai in the sections of vascular medicine and vascular diagnostic laboratory. Dr. Dedov is principal investigator of Mount Sinai ISCAD registry site. Thank you for joining us too today. 
And also Dr. Brian Goshadra is a board certified diagnostic radiologist at the Massachusetts General Hospital. Dr. Goshadra specializes in the use of cross -section, advanced cross-sectional imaging techniques and to non-invasively diagnose diseases of blood vessels and heart. Clinical interests include advanced non-invasive imaging for coronary artery disease, peripheral vascular and venous diseases, and congenital heart disease. So we're really excited to have all three of you here today. We're going to start with Dr. Kem with an overview. So I'll pass it over to you. Thank you, Rebecca, and thank you, Scott Alliance, for hosting this wonderful webinar series. Um, I'm excited to talk about um, the vasculature today, and uh, the purpose of today is to really get to the heart of some of the questions um, about some findings we might find outside of the heart. Um, and so that will be our focus, and I'm going to start off by giving a brief um, PowerPoint presentation with images, because, um, and maybe Dr. Goshar will be happy to hear this, but I think images are worth a thousand words and more. Um, and I love showing patients images to kind of get the point through. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Okay. So I think many of us have seen this figure before. This is the figure from the American Heart Association consensus statement on um, the treatment of patients with spontaneous coronary artery dissection. And what um, a dissection is, is a tear in the artery, whether or not there is actually a rent on the inside part of the artery. And Dr. D um, Katie and Dodov is also going to be um, covering some of the architecture of the vessel wall, but an artery has three different layers and they are, for lack of a better word, glued together and they should function as one but sometimes there is bleeding within the separate layers, within the muscular layer and the inside layer. And when that happens, you get something called an intramural hematoma, which is very much like a bruise on the inside of the artery itself. Sometimes the pressure buildup gets so high that it will actually cause a tear or a rent on the inside of that artery and you get what looks like a classic dissection. And so spontaneous coronary artery dissection is defined as a non-traumatic, you weren't in a car accident or anything else that shook your body very hard, non-iatrogenic, meaning no doctor did this to you while doing a procedure or a heart cath, separation of the coronary arterial wall by intramural hemorrhage, creating a false lumen with or without a tear. Now, um, just to review SCAD just a little bit to start this webinar off, we know that it's not a very common cause of heart attack, but it is a pretty um, important cause of heart attack in young women, although we know that older women as well as men can be affected as well. Most people present with um, positive troponins and sometimes EKG changes, and so myocardial infarction is really the rule and not the exception. We also know um, that many doctors think about coronary dissection in the context of pregnancy-related heart attack, but the majority of cases of SCAD we know now are not related to pregnancy. We also know that there are some different um, associated triggers um, and uh, events that um, patients frequently point to uh, that they can identify before they had their SCAD. For instance, very intense exercise, maybe a new exercise routine or heavy lifting, retching, coughing, um, lifting something heavy, as I said, intense emotional stress. Um, and so about half of patients can find a precipitating trigger for that. There are others um, who have systemic um, inflammatory diseases such as lupus or rheumatoid arthritis and um, others who also have known connective tissue diseases such as vascular Ehlers-Danlos or Marfan syndrome. But as you can see from these percentages, um, the known inflammatory and connective tissue diseases comprise a minority of patients who also have SCAD. And so this was recently published in a review article um, in the Journal of the American College of Cardiology. If we think about spontaneous coronary artery dissection, there are many identified risk factors such as patients who are pregnant, have high blood pressure, have known um, connective tissue disorders or other genes that we know are associated with dissection. And then there is this big circle here for fibromuscular dysplasia and associated arteriopathies. Arteriopathies is kind of a cool word. All it really means is pathology of the arteries. 
Um, and so when we look outside of the heart in patients who have coronary dissection, we frequently find either findings of fibromuscular dysplasia or other artery problems such as aneurysm or dissection. And then on the outside circle here um, are the precipitating factors. So, you know, getting a coronary dissection probably isn't just a genetic problem or just an environmental problem for the vast majority of patients. It's probably going to be an underlying predisposition and then it, a trigger of some sort, i.e. it's some kind of perfect storm that causes this event to happen. So as I said, um, is SCAD a disease in isolation? I, I think not. Um, here is an example of a 45-year-old woman who presented with a coronary dissection heart attack. And if we did a CAT scan from head to pelvis, we would find that she actually has beating consistent with fibromuscular dysplasia in her kidney arteries. And unfortunately, my arrow is right on top of the finding here, but her carotid artery actually makes a complete loop inside her neck, which is unusual to find. Um, we know that the cause of SCAD is unknown, but it may be the presentation of an underlying arterial disease in some patients. Um, so these of four SCAD patients were identified in June 2016 to September. Sorry, that was a pre-recorded. That was data from the, uh, va the Vanderbilt Clinic. And what we found in about 100 patients is about a 45% prevalence of fibromuscular dysplasia. And we also found 15 of the 52 patients who did have abnormal findings outside the heart also had an aneurysm, eight had a pseudoaneurysm, and still another nine had a dissection outside of the heart. So in about half of patients in our series that we presented at the American College of Cardiology meeting um, this past spring, there are extra coronary vascular findings. So what are these extra coronary vascular findings? The one we're gonna focus on today is fibromuscular dysplasia. And I'm not gonna steal the thunder from Dr. Katie and Dodo because she's gonna do a deep dive in this, but basically the uh, fibromuscular dysplasia findings um, on CT scans or MRIs are generally of this type where we see beading in the artery. Um, and this disease process, fibromuscular dysplasia, has also been associated with aneurysm, dissection, tortuous vessels as well. Um, and it is also a non-inflammatory, non-atherosclerotic disease of the arteries primarily affecting women. So there are going to be a few words used today, and I just wanted to clarify what those words meant from the beginning. So what do we mean when we say that something is an aneurysm? An aneurysm is simply an abnormal bulge or ballooning of an artery, and this is caused by weakening of the arterial wall. And there are different types of aneurysms. Um, the more common type is this fusiform type of aneurysm where the artery is of normal caliber and the entire artery tends to bulge out like a balloon. Then there is this second type called a saccular aneurysm where you can make out a normal caliber artery, but in one part of it, there is this bulging out like in this picture here. Um, and here's an example of a fusiform aneurysm of the aorta. This is actually a brain aneurysm. Sometimes you may hear a word ectatic or ectasia, and that falls right into the category of aneurysm. It's just, it doesn't meet the size criteria. So it's a little bit enlarged more than normal, but we wouldn't necessarily call it an aneurysm. Uh, the definition size-wise of a, an aneurysm will vary depending on the vascular bed and how big the normal artery should be. But generally when an artery is 1.5 times or two times the size of the normal artery, it is considered an aneurysm. A pseudoaneurysm, um, even though it has the word aneurysm in it, tends to be a little bit different. It doesn't involve all three layers. Rather, it occurs when there's been a defect on the inside of uh, inside layer of the artery, and the the pressure from inside the blood vessel causes this outpouching. So here is an example of a pseudoaneurysm in a patient who had a prior carotid dissection, and you can see that there is a little bit of a pouch. Um, in the left internal carotid artery there. So an aneurysm involves all three layers 
of the artery and a pseudoaneurysm is an outpouching, sort of limited, um, probably because of a prior dissection. And then when we talk about tortuosity, um, I say, it, you know, it almost looks like your arteries have gotten a perm or that there's a roller coaster. Um, this is an extreme example of arterial tortuosity um, in a patient who has a known connective tissue disease. And you can see that in contrast to a normal artery, a carotid artery that goes, um, or a vertebral artery that actually goes up the neck here like this in a straight line, this patient's um, arteries are very twisty, turvy, and sort of meander up to the brain. And we can also see this on ultrasound very well as well. Here is an example of a patient who has some aneurysms, some tortuosity, and some fibromuscular dysplasia. And you can see in this case that these things can coexist um, and you can have multiple findings even just in one artery. Well, we know that aneurysm and dissection aren't rare in patients with coronary dissection, but it turns out that it's not rare in fibromuscular dysplasia either. And so when we look at data from the FMDSA registry, we find that um, about one out of five patients have at least one aneurysm if you were to do a head to pelvis screen. About one out of four will have had at least one dissection. And if you put them all together, four out of 10 um, will have a aneurysm or a dissection. So uh, FMD is known as the string of, B, string of pearls, um, but it is also aneurysm and dissection and tortuosity. So what is the relationship between SCAD and FMD? We know that if we were to do a CT scan of a SCAD patient from head to pelvis, about 45 to all the way up to 86, depending on the type of modality you use, you'll find that classic beating. But if you look at the FMDSA registry and look to see how many patients have had SCAD in the past, um, it's less than, 3%. And so we're waiting for these data to be updated, um, but I don't think that the majority of patients with FMD are going to have SCAD. So what does this mean? It probably means that SCAD is probably a presentation of an underlying artery disease such as FMD. And so in summary, more than half the time, SCAD is not an isolated disease. Um, it can be a presentation of FMD, but not all patients with FMD will experience a SCAD. And the link between SCAD and FMD and other vascular findings still requires more study. And with that, I'll end my presentation and hand it over to um, Rebecca. And I'm going to hand it, thank you so much. We're going to hand it straight over to Dr. Katie and Dodoff to go into some details about FMD. Thank you so much. Um, I hope you can hear me. <laughs> it's really a, an honor for me to be here with you all today. So um, I'm going to go a little bit deeper into um, what was a great introduction by Dr. Kim on what is FMD. And so to kick that off, we'll start with normal artery anatomy. So as um, Dr. Kim was saying, a normal artery has three layers, which provides it its ability to adjust and withstand the flow of blood um, throughout the body. And in general, you should think about arteries as pipes that provide blood supply to whatever artery it's going to. Um, and so these pipes should be straight in a, in a normal person. As you can see here, carotid artery coming up, dividing and providing straight line blood flow up to the brain. Now FMD, um, the actual name of it, fibromuscular dysplasia, comes from the term bad molding. And what this is really is an overgrowth of one of the layers in the arterial wall. And depending on which layer is affected, you get a different appearance in the arteries. So that typical string of beads um, that we refer to is when the middle layer, the media, is affected by overgrowth. Um, these days, we refer to this as multifocal FMD, since we're making most of our diagnoses based on imaging and not on um, pathologic specimens, since most patients don't actually require surgery um, or, or invasive intervention like that today. Um, the second type is focal FMD, um, which is a single area of stenosis that can occur if the innermost or outermost layer of the artery wall is affected by this overgrowth. And this appears as a single area of stenosis. So we will define the type of FMD based on the appearance um, when patients get imaging, the most common being multifocal FMD. Now, as Dr. Kim said, this is non-atherosclerotic, meaning it's not due to cholesterol plaque. 
not inflammatory um, disease that we usually see in the middle of the artery or the end portion of the artery. And it's a disease that most often affects women, particularly the multifocal type. And we usually identify patients um, around age, age 50 for multifocal FMD. The carotid and the renal arteries are most often affected, although any artery can be um, and has been reported. And the etiology and population prevalence is not really known, although based on um, kidney donor data, actually people who underwent screening when they were donating a kidney for somebody, um, incidental FMD was identified in almost as much as 5%. Um, and so our best guess is that it may affect as many as 5% of adult women in the US. And the symptoms really depend on the disease location. So for carotid and vertebral artery FMD, patients report headaches very often, about 50% of patients. Pulsatile tinnitus, which is a whooshing sound in the ear in about a third of patients. Um, neck pain or a bruit, that's the doctor hearing the whooshing when they put the stethoscope on your neck, um, is seen in about a fifth of patients. Uh, hypertension is seen most often in patients with uh, renal artery FMD. And for coronary involvement of FMD, the predominant presentation is SCAD. We don't really see um, other manifestations uh, in the coronary vasculature. So patients with coronary FMD present with myocardial infarction, not very common as Dr. Esther said, but um, that usually is due to SCAD or is due to SCAD. Now the other manifestations that we can attribute to FMD um, include aneurysm, I uh, see a renal artery, saccular aneurysm here, SCAD or dissection um, affecting the coronary artery here and a dissection of a um, cervical artery, carotid artery here with a pseudoaneurysm, extreme arterial tortuosity, but the only way that we can say that these findings are due to FMD is if we identify those um, those findings of beating or a single area of stenosis because FMD is the only thing that will cause that appearance in the arteries. Whereas many other conditions can also cause aneurysm dissection or arterial tortuosity. So this is data that um, Esther just went over, Dr. Kim just went over regarding the rates of aneurysm and dissection in the US registry for FMD. Um, and again, just to reiterate, we can't attribute an aneurysm or dissection to FMD unless they have um, FMD in another vascular bed, meaning that beating appearance or a single area of stenosis. And based on the rates, the high rates of aneurysm and dissection in patients with FMD, like SCAD, all patients with FMD are recommended to undergo head to pelvis imaging um, to evaluate what their arteries look like and what may need to be followed going forward. Now, um, I wanted to get into a little bit of the genetics of FMD. So our, our feeling is it definitely is a genetic condition. Um, this was a publication that came out in vascular medicine yes, last year regarding identical twins who both have multifocal FMD. One twin had two small cerebral aneurysms, ICA, meaning parotid, and vertebral artery FMD, as well as renal artery FMD. And her identical twin, had different findings. So both carotid arteries had multifocal FMD. This twin had splenic artery aneurysms and only renal artery multifocal FMD. So while genetics is definitely a part of what causes FMD, like SCAD, there may be more than one thing contributing, um, which we, we don't know what that is yet, probably partly environmental, um, that leads to a person's manifestations of fibromuscular dysplasia. And then this represents um, a family cohort that I follow, you, follow um, just to illustrate that I think that FMD and associated arteriopathies is um, referred to that way because of an increasing spectrum of findings that we see associated with these patients. So um, these are three sisters down here. The mother is up here. The first sister I met was this 45 year old in the middle who experienced SCAD and on screening um, or evaluation was found to have carotid artery FMD. Her sisters were recommended to come in for screening. Um, and so they were found to have renal and carotid artery FMD in one sister. And the third sister had no findings of fibromuscular dysplasia, but only splenic artery aneurysms. 
So if I was seeing that sister the first time, I wouldn't be able to say her aneurysms are due to FMD, but with her family history, it's very suspicious that her aneurysms are a manifestation of FMD. Um, and this is likely a larger spectrum than at the current time we're able to diagnose in every patient. The fact that the mother experienced this Takasubo cardiomyopathy is significant because it was a long time ago. And we've now realized that many of these patients who have Takasubo cardiomyopathy may actually have the cardiomyopathy due to SCAD. Um, and at that time, it may have been missed since we didn't know as much about it as we do today. And then finally, um, there is some genetic basis for the clinical overlap between um, conditions, including SCAD and FMD and cervical artery dissection. So this is one genetic locus that's been identified. Um, and patients that carry this locus have a lower rate of atherosclerosis or cholesterol plaque, but seem to have an increased risk for cervical artery dissection, FMD, migraine headaches, and SCAD. Um, so there's definitely an overlap in these conditions that and this is the first genetic basis for that overlap that we're able to see. And with that, I will hand it back. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much for getting into that. Um, Dr. Garshadra, I want to go ahead and get over to you because I know we've talked already a little bit about just how important imaging is in this diagnosis or these diagnoses. Thank you. Um, these are tough acts to follow. Um, I prepared slides, but I actually, um, I'm going to jump around uh, here and there because I, I was, um, I just want to answer a few few questions that, that came up. But um, uh, we talked a little bit about SCAD and, and, um, and we talked about CT, both in the, uh, for looking at FMD and, and um, FMD in the corners, which is SCAD. So um, there, there's a there's a lot of uh, conflicting information, and I'll explain to you why that is and probably should be conflicting um, uh, information about when we should use CT scans and other types of scans. So, um, you know, it, as, a, uh, as an imager that does everything except the invasive um, angiograms, uh, one of the points that I always make is that CT is often, but definitely not always, uh, uh, the best test to figure out whether you've had a SCAD. So, um, number one would be your initial evaluation, but there's a lot of heart attacks that should not stop at the CT scanner. They should go right to the cath lab. Uh, but provided you're stable enough, CT, if your hospital has it, might be a good way to do it. Um, and then there's also when we've kind of got a, what we think is a SCAD or we have a new diagnosis. So we, we might use CT to look at the heart, but even more importantly, and for the purposes of today, we're going to look at a lot of other vessels. So there's a, it's a CT scanning can be a great way to look from the head to the pelvis. Um, you can do a lot of that, but not all of it with MRIs. Um, and I'll talk about why ultrasound um, is very good for targeted imaging, but it's a long study to do and it's not good for, um, for some vessels. Um, and then the other way that we use CT scanning is to clarify a suspected diagnosis. Um, in fact, I'll, I'll think sometimes a picture is, um, is the best way to talk. So I'll um, show you the next slide here, which is um, just this one forward. So these are, um, so, you know, six separate patients. Um, each of them um, has heart disease, and we're trying to figure out which one of them actually had a SCAD. Um, and if you look at the, uh, the old way we looked at vessels, um, our, our, our prior gold standard was the invasive angiogram. That's what these are. So these are all uh, people's hearts, the catheters and the coronary arteries. And um, you might notice that in, in number, uh, in, in letter A, um, that the distal vessel down at the bottom uh, right of the screen looks a little narrowed, but it's hard to tell what's causing that narrowing. Is it plaque? Is it, a, um, is it a, a classic atherosclerotic plaque? Or maybe it's a stat. Um, B, if you look at that, that's the right side of the heart, and you can see some kind of a big glob kind of filling the artery there that doesn't look like it's uh, filled in normally, and then it just kind of cuts off at the bottom right of the screen. Uh, and there's something similar in each one of these uh, images. And obviously, uh, it takes a, a couple of decades to learn how to read invasive and perform invasive angiograms. But I'll, uh, if you click one slide forward, I've circled the abnormalities for you. Um, and what this it, vessel lumen picture tells us is um, that there's something abnormal. It doesn't tell you what. So um, one of the ways that we use um, CT scanning on these elective cases is to figure out, is it SCAD or CAD? So classic coronary artery disease, that thing that you've probably heard of and that it tends to affect older men, but can affect women as well, is often underdiagnosed. So if we look at the next slide, uh, I'll just pose that question to you. And then this next slide here um, is a superimposed CT scan for each of these patients. And so um, what I'm showing you in, in figure A is that if you do a CT the right way, it looks 
just like the invasive angiogram. So that's a lot of caveat. You have to have a CT scanner that's good enough, someone that can read it and make this kind of image. Um, uh, image B, I'm just showing you that this is a very long corner dissection. And so we can actually now see not just the narrowings, but the thing causing the narrowings. And in case B, that actually is a corner dissection. Uh, this is a young man that had a very big tear in the vessel. And you can see where that last red arrow is. That's actually that uh, intramural hematoma. So that's a, a blood, um, blood in between the layers of the walls compressing that um, vessel. So it makes it a very clear diagnosis. Also, he doesn't have any plaque. So he's, he does not have CAD, but SCAD. Um, uh, I think number uh, C uh, in, the, in the distal part of it there. So on the, um, on the right. Uh, and in fact, I, I have some uh, circles for you to click one more slide uh, further. You'll see that uh, labels and arrows make it that much easier. So you can see there's actually a vessel missing that wasn't seen on the angiogram. So the angiogram was interpreted as normal. Um, but the patient uh, had an echocardiogram, which showed that the heart muscle wasn't functioning normally. And some of our smart cardiologists came to me and said, this doesn't line up. You've got a normal angiogram and you've got an abnormal ultrasound. And what are we going to look at? So they did a CT scan and we can actually see that the, uh, there's the, the narrowing. Um, and uh, same thing in case F, actually. That's a, uh, and that's where we'll go. With it. So cases D and E are actually classic coronary artery disease that one of the patients had a stent. Um, so they don't get any circles. These are classic, the more, more common pathology affecting the coronaries, confirmed with CT, very good for that. But case F actually is a case where that same situation happened where we have a vessel missing, but we have a normal angiogram and actually you can, it's hard to see what's not there. Um, and we went on further. And so the, the little thumbnail up in the corner of F is uh, that classic beating that, that, uh, that Dr. Kim and, and Dr. Um, Dodoff showed you the, of the, um, uh, the, the classic FMV findings in the kidneys. And kidneys are actually um, uh, small uh, organs, not unlike hearts, that have small vessels that are really well evaluated by, by CT scanning. So um, we kind of grabbed a couple of different imaging tests and put together the diagnosis in, in retrospect. Um, uh, one more slide forward, I'll just show you that the, um, um, there's not a great amount of evidence for CT. And there's not a great amount of evidence for anything. I think uh, 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 Rebecca gave a really nice intro. And uh, this is kind of uncharted territory for a lot of physicians and it's it's a I'm glad that the uh, the society exists just to get awareness out there um, 10 years ago I didn't believe this was a real thing I didn't I hadn't really heard of it but in a couple of case reports uh, and now it's probably not a day goes by I, we had a, a one of the doctors at our hospital uh, diagnosed just the other day um, and uh, hadn't heard of it until we told him what his diagnosis was um, so so anyway a couple of um, small studies um, and if I click one if you should click one more slide forward so why is that? Well, um, CT scans uh, are in every, every test and every imaging test are a series of trade-offs. And so I just want to compare the invasive angiogram. So in this case, it's an image of the coronary arteries on the right and a non-invasive CT scan. And so if you look at, uh, I put a little star on the, uh, the winner of each little battle, if you will. So spatial resolution. Well, the invasive angiogram is much finer resolution. You can see smaller vessels. Um, whereas the CT scan is not quite as good. It makes pretty pictures, which are great for presentations, but um, it won't show the small vessels with the same precision. Um, the temporal resolution, so the shutter speed, you know, I mean, it's probably a little dated now, but when I was a kid, we used to buy film in these, you could get disposable cameras and you had to buy indoor or outdoor film. And the outdoor film took great pictures if you had a lot of light, whereas the indoor film, it, it opened the shutter for a long time to get a, a nice picture. Uh, and uh, so they were great if you were having an indoor birthday party, but if you were having a backyard picnic, you would get the fast film. Well, uh, an invasive angiogram is fast film. It's a really fast shutter speed. You don't get a lot of blurring. Whereas the CT scan takes a little longer to get all that data and then compute the angiogram. And so it can take, uh, you know, 10, even 20 times as long to make one image. So a beating heart might be, be a challenge. And um, what that means is that uh, older scanners, you know, maybe uh, 10, 20 years ago when I was in training, uh, we didn't have fast scanners. And when we, um, uh, when we fast forward to today, we have very rapid scanners that can freeze cardiac motion, that can see finer, um, uh, finer detail and catch that, uh, the contrast as it goes right through the arteries. You know, one of the, the, the uh, killer applications for CT early on was just um, finding blood in the head. So uh, stroke doctors, neurologists looked a lot at that. Um, well, heads don't move. The patient could lay there for a good five, 10 minutes and we could make an image. Um, you don't get that luxury with beating heart. Or if you're trying to make an arterial angiogram, if I'm injecting the contrast directly of the artery, it's very easy to catch the artery. But with the CT scan, we inject an, an, a vein in your arm and let the blood flow all the way through 
go through your heart and catch it at the exact right moment, that requires a rapid scanner. And that's only become recently possible. So that touches on the contrast type. And so um, the beauty of a, of a CT scan angiogram is that it won't hurt your arteries by injecting your veins. Whereas when we do a catheter angiogram, we have to place the catheter near the vessel of interest. And that's where CT starts to really um, uh, shine. Um, so the invasive angiogram can damage the vessel if you're not careful. And so we try to reserve the, um, the angiogram for when we know we're either gonna benefit the patient by treating or we really do need that spatial or temporal resolution. So if we can do something um, with a non-invasive test, be it a CT, ultrasound, or MRI, it's often a place, not always, but often a place we start. So um, the contrast resolution of a CT is really where we uh, are better. Also, we can see lots of densities. So many, I can't show you them all. So here's a, a, a case we wrote up, uh, a woman um, that was visiting her um, mother in the hospital um, and she had a tearing in her chest, which we now know is a classic history. Here's her um, invasive angiogram showing that there is a dissection. You can see that kind of lumen change sizes. Um, and rather than put her back, actually she did great, by the way, she happened to be visit, visiting her mother in the hospital. So you can't get closer to healthcare than literally being on top of the cath lab one floor away. So we got her right in. Um, and as soon as our really good angiographer saw that finding, because he was aware because of all the work that, that, uh, that, that um, everyone on this call has been doing, um, he said, I'm going to stop right there. We're going to give medical management. We're not going to do any stenting, no surgery needed. She did really well. Um, and so the, I think the next slide will show you um, when they decided to see if this got better. Now, she had recurrent pain. We don't need to look just to have a look, but it turned out that, that after a couple of months, she had some squirrely pain and they wanted to see, did, did the vessel heal itself fully? Did it occlude fully? Where, where does it stand? Um, and so this is one of those uses of CT where now she's stable, she's not having acute pain, um, and we were able to get her into the scanner. And you can see really that the, the, the vessel is just a little bit bigger these days. Um, it it did not, um, didn't fully heal, but it didn't get any worse. So we knew that the pain wasn't a worsening of the tear, a worsening of the occlusion. Um, and and uh, I'm going to click, uh, if you can show me one more click forward. Um, so this is her ultrasound of the heart, so an echocardiogram. And one of the things they did around the time of that angiogram is look, and you can see that the top half of this view, it's looking like a little V, kind of, kind of like a, a mouth kind of flapping at you. And so um, near the, the top half of that little um, grayscale image, you can see it's not moving quite as well. And that's a really good way to use ultrasound is to look at the, the tissue supplied by a vessel. We could do the same thing with a kidney. Um, and, and what we can see here on the CT scan is that um, matched up to that, the vessel, uh, um, the vessel didn't get worse. And now the, the, the myocardium, that grayish on the, on the right panel, is moving just fine. So she did recover her, her function. So any damage to the heart was minimal um, because she got the right treatment. So a good use of CT and it also kind of shows you this CT image, you can see the coronary arteries on the top have just like little specks of them. There's just no way to resolve small arteries like that. Their coronary arteries at their biggest segment are three millimeters. Uh, and that's kind of beyond the resolution of ultrasound, except if you can put the probe right, say on the carotid artery, you might find things like that. But um, the, the renal arteries, the uh, coronary arteries are just too deep and too far away from the ultrasound machine to get a good image. Um, maybe that changes in the future, but right now um, we can't look directly at arteries. Uh, with ultrasound, uh, but with rare exceptions. Um, I'll show you one more case. This is just the, uh, the, the case I already showed you where um, one of our cardiologists picked up that there was um, a, a vessel, the vessels were normal, they had recovered, but there was evidence of an infarct. You kind of see how the, the, the pointy part of the heart at the bottom left of the screen, the apex is, uh, is thin. So um, we went on and collected all the information and we went back. And, and this is another teaching point that I'll, I'll show in my summary slide as well. But if you go one more image further, what happened is, an invasive angiogram happened at one hospital. Um, the ultrasound hop happened at that hospital, but um, then the patient came to our hospital for a second opinion. And then um, our cardiologist got a CT scan at our hospital and none of us could see each other's images. So what happened was the only person that had all the information was the cardiologist who had to collect further information. So once she said, hey, this is, does not add up here. I've got a normal CT, a normal cath, abnormal ultrasound, uh, a normal CT, but with abnormalities in, in the muscle, uh, let's put it all together. Um, and actually what we did was one step forward, we said, let's look at more vessels because what are we can do. So, um, so uh, you know, this, is, this would have been termed MINOCA or MI, myocardial infarction with normal coronary arteries or non-obstructed coronary arteries, but 
in reality, you can see that the vessel missing where the arrows were came back. Um, so the, the three arrows show what, what restored. And the, the biggest way when you have a discrepancy is to get a, get a referee. And the referee was the kidney arteries, the renal arteries. And that's what the next slide shows here is that, uh, that classic beating uh, that, uh, that, that um, everyone's been showing you. And so, as you know, um, we find that in a lot of patients um, in our registry, we found some form of arterial abnormality, not always classic FMD, but some arterial abnormality in nearly all the patients in our registry that came for SCAD but got the full workup. So uh, it's very, uh, very common. So um, at any rate, uh, and I think I just, in this next slide here, I'm showing you, we can do all those scans at once if needed. Here's somebody with a little bit of a, an infarct. You can see how there's a part of the heart that's not moving. I'm also showing you how we're just scanning stem to stern. Um, on this uh, kind of volume rendered picture that looks like a skeleton, because Halloween's coming, I guess. But um, you can see there's little wedge-shaped infarctions of the kidneys. So even when we don't see the kidneys, I'm not showing you arteries to show you the art, um, showing you vessel images that are really great. I can show you here on these images that the iliac arteries are abnormal, but that there's end organ damage of the, um, of the kidneys there. So you might just pick that up on, a, say, an appendicitis scan that wouldn't be good enough to look at any arteries, but you might say, why is there a kidney infarct? And you might need to put it together. By the way, the coronary artery is totally patent in this patient. Okay, so anyway, that's all my slides. Um, we can just skip right to the final slide. Um, so here's my pearls, um, is you know, when we can, and it won't be always, we might wanna start with a non-invasive test because we won't damage any arteries, just having a look. Um, invasive angiography does bring that elevated risk, so we always think about when can we avoid it. Um, but most importantly is an accurate diagnosis. A lot of patients end up in, in, uh, in our colleagues' clinics um, or on our imaging um, uh, schedule because we don't know what's going on. So accuracy matters most. Um, and so I'll just give you a couple of pointers. CT is very good for coronaries. It's good for coronary artery disease like plaque or SCAD, which are totally opposite diagnoses. It's good for small and medium sized arteries, but not the tiny ones. Um, MRI, it's good for myocardium. So looking at the heart muscle. Um, you can do an MRA in some body parts, but not the coronaries. It can be good for kidneys. It can be good for, um, for the, the neuro circulation like the carotids. Um, but it's very independent. Every one of these tests is dependent on local expertise. Um, and then ICA, so invasive coronary angiography or invasive renal angiography. Usually you save that for acute heart attacks or if you're thinking about maybe putting a stent in. Um, ultrasound, great test, widely available. It gets better all the time. Um, it's good for looking at the heart muscle, the kidney, you know, the, the, the meat of the kidney um, in some vessels. Um, but if it misses something, you need to go further. So you may actually have gotten an ultrasound. You may get further ultrasounds, but, but um, we just need to know that it could miss certain things and we might need to look further. So it's always got to be lined up. So, and this is just my personal advice uh, after doing this for a, um, a couple of years now is that healthcare is a very local and personal phenomenon. It's an art and a science. So um, you, the patient and your doctor um, should together explore the best options available. Not everything's available everywhere. So. Uh, you know, the, the CT scanner that I have access to in downtown Boston uh, may not be available uh, if I were to, you know, drive to Western Massachusetts where it's a lot less, uh, less more sparsely populated. Um, and they might not have an expert like Dr. Kim or Dr. Um, uh, Dr. Dodoff here. So we might not have somebody that has the knowledge about how to trigger that test or someone to do the test or even the testing equipment. Um, I really think it's the, um, uh, the professionals performing and interpreting the uh, equipment uh, that the scan that contribute just as much or even more than the equipment itself. Um, and then fragmented care, like I told you the story of the patient that had an angiogram at one hospital and ultrasound at another. Um, so it's, it's a very real issue these days. Um, and just if you're getting an imaging test, um, please make sure the radiologist that's interpreting that scan that he or she knows about all the other tests you've had or might have access to them if you can provide them. Um, otherwise, we may not be able to put the picture together um, to help you. That's all, uh, that's all my pearls for you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, all three of you. This is great information and really gives a good foundation for this. I want to jump on over to questions just because we had so many. I don't want to try to get to as many as possible. Um, so starting with diagnosis, um, I think each of you have alluded to this and you know, there's a lot of steps to it. It's not entirely straightforward. Um, we had a patient that wrote, you know, after their SCAD, they had a CT to check for potential FMD. And the, they were told that typical areas were fine, but they had a small aneurysm on their splenic artery. Um, could that still indicate an FMD diagnosis in isolation? Dr. Dr. Katie and Dodov, I think you mentioned 
that if it's yeah sure i'll take that one so um so again unless you see the classic string of beads or single area of stenosis um then you cannot assign a diagnosis of fibromuscular dysplasia that being said um you know if there was no other indication of any other genetic arteriopathy or condition associated with SCAD or aneurysm in this patient, um, this would be someone that I would kind of put in that spectrum bucket um, that I was talking about. And I would frankly treat them exactly the same way that I treat my FMD patients or SCAD only patients. The treatment is very much the same for both. And it focuses mostly on reducing stress on the artery walls in any way possible with blood pressure control and lifestyle modifications and some kind of follow up with surveillance imaging, depending on your individual findings. Wonderful. Thank you. And kind of the follow on that, if a patient has a CT and MRI and is told no FMD, you're good to go, can they develop FMD or develop aneurysms going forward? Or once you're told you're good, you're good? So that's a really great question. Um, I, I said in my slides that we usually diagnose people around age 50. Um, and I will say that once we diagnose people and get that screening exam or first time imaging exam, um, the general kind of rule or our experience has been that people do not tend to form new changes over time, meaning that if they have beating in one location, I don't see beating form in a new location on a follow up imaging exam. Um, new dissection is something that can happen suddenly and very, very rarely new aneurysm. So if this patient is in their you know, 50s and has had this scan, um, I think it's probably likely that this is what they're going to have. Um, but the real answer is we don't, we don't know. Uh, no one has done that follow-up prognosis um, you know, Absolutely. study. Absolutely. Um, and with imaging, Dr. Gashadra, does imaging have a role in SCAD follow-up? Um, I think you alluded to one of the patients you showed, you happen to have done imaging, but is any sort of imaging typically done to check for, say, resolution of a tear or not necessarily? Generally, we reserve imaging for um, symptoms. So um, I, I think the main um, uh, guiding light you should use to say, do I need an imaging test? It should be a joint decision with, with your doctor and it should be to answer a specific question that will change their management. So if you had a SCAD and, and you're doing fine, um, there's not a real reason to just have a look. Um, we've learned, and this is true throughout medicine, um, that screening generally doesn't um, save lives uh, and certainly um, following things just to follow them. Um, there's a handful of exceptions and some of them are in blood vessels, but in the setting of SCAD, it's such a difficult diagnosis that unless there's a compelling reason that uh, a change is happening in symptoms or in um, uh, something else, some other parameter in the heart, um, then we would uh, go forward. But um, on the question of should we just have a look or periodically look, it's generally not something we do. Okay. I wanted to expand on that. Um, some of the situations where a doctor may want to have another look at the coronaries, um, I agree this is uh, the, the exception and not the rule, is if there is um, a question of whether it was a SCAD or not. So um, as multiple people have said on this call, if you see FMD somewhere, our sort of suspicion that it was SCAD goes up. Um, but if you're not sure and everything else looks fine, we, can, we sometimes do repeat image because if the blockage suddenly becomes normal, it has quote healed, then we know that it was not um, a cholesterol plaque stenosis, rather it was something that's dynamic like a healing dissection. Sometimes we'll also repeat imaging if um, there, the location of the SCAD is in a very important place in the heart where there's a lot of heart muscle at risk. And we just kind of want to see that things are going in the right direction, that things truly are healing um, so that patients don't need to be monitored more closely to get maybe a stent or a bypass surgery if they develop symptoms. So those are some of the reasons a doctor might order another test. But again, um, pretty uncommon for that to happen, but can be useful um, if needed. It makes sense. Um, thank you, both of you, for that. Um, 
several patients ask if there's anything that you recommend to strengthen the vasculature as a means of preventing SCAD recurrence, such as collagen supplements, vitamin B12. Do we know anything about that, um, Dr. Kim? Or you can pass it on. <laughs> what a good question. I think that, um, you know, medical research runs like this. If you have a blockbuster drug that's going to make a lot of money, there's going to be a lot of randomized controlled trials. Um, but if you have a food product, like a vitamin, there's not going to be a lot of money to run those clinical trials. And so uh, even more so than for the medicines, the vitamins and the supplements are really not studied. Um, you know, I wouldn't brush them off. It's just we don't know. They're considered a food product and they haven't been studied. I don't know that they're going to be harmful. Um, but they may not be of benefit necessarily. Um, we do know that um, Dr. Saw in Canada has shown us in her studies, um, and these really need to be replicated and validated in larger studies, but um, good control of your blood pressure if you have high blood pressure and being on beta blockers, if you're able to tolerate those, may um, decrease the risk of recurrence. But in terms of food and supplements, we, we don't know yet. Okay, absolutely. Um, what about is SCAD, we had a question that was asked, is SCAD recurrence higher in patients who do have FMD? Um, Dr. Katie and Dodov, if we know. Um, not, not as far as we know, but you know, these are two very rare conditions and then the, the overlap together is an even smaller piece of the pie. So um, very small numbers and we, we honestly don't know, but um, you know, again, they're treated the same and the follow-up is the same for the both of them. That makes sense, thank you. Um, Dr. Gashadra, we ha there's a question that asks about the risk of angiogram causing further tear in SCAD patients. I think the question seems like it's around the time of SCAD um, and then also going forward, you know, for future imaging, is there a risk of, of tear? Um, so angiograms, um, there's some risk and it has to do with the, the, the catheter being nearby and the pressure um, that we inject the, the, the contrast that makes the picture. Um, so uh, one thing that you're gonna benefit from these days is that the awareness is so much better. So um, the awareness of this, what we thought was rare, but I don't think you can quite call it a rare disease. Um, now that we know we've probably maybe been missing it. Um, so we, but angiographers are much more aware um, to look for it and to stop as soon as they see something and just be very careful. Um, most um, centers that do angiograms have somebody that kind of becomes the champion or the point person. And that's true for angiograms, for ultrasounds, for MRIs, CTs. So um, what I think um, is helpful if you do end up going in knowing there's a scatter, a strong suspicion is to, to be aware ahead of time and often that people will consult their colleagues if they see something they're not sure of. Um, and some patients do go back to the cath lab for very good reason. Um, and, and so uh, that's a nice more controlled setting when you've already know what you're dealing with, so. Okay, fair enough. Um, we had several kind of specific questions. I just wanna do a quick round for some of those. Um, the patient asked if things like hot tubs affect the vasculature in patients with SCAD and FMD. Dr. Kim, you look like you want that one. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, I don't know that sitting in a hot tub is going to affect your arteries so much. It's, uh, but if you're on a blood pressure medicine like beta blockers and you sit in a hot tub or take a hot shower and then the blood vessels in your skin all dilate and the blood will go to your skin and not to your brain. When you get out of that hot tub, you might feel a little woozy. Um, but I, I don't see any problem with people who've had scared. Please sit in the hot tub. Just be careful and drink lots of water. Excellent, thank you. Um, another one that asked about exogenous hormones, so either hormone replacement therapy or for contraceptives, um, does that affect the vasculature? Um, do we know how that affects, you know, for patients who have had SCAD or patients with FMD? Dr. Katie and Dodov, I'll pass over to you. Sure, sure. Um, so we, we have seen some SCAD events occur around times of high hormone fluctuations, like pregnancy, for example, but um, the relationship between taking these exogenous hormones and a SCAD event is honestly, you know, not known, not studied. Um, so another don't know. That work. Um, when it seems like that what reiterates that point of talking with your provider about what is that risk and benefit of preventing pregnant, you know, planning pregnancy, um, 
versus the other event. One hundred percent. Yeah, and and also if your event happened to be during the time of pregnancy, um, and you were thinking about the possibility of a of a repeat um, pregnancy, then that would be really important information um, to talk through with your provider. But it's very individual. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, do we know any relationship between SCAD, FMD, and DVTs or deep vein throm thrombosis? No. <laughs> I'll take that one. Um, no, so uh, FMD seems to be purely an arterial problem um, and SCAD also. And so if there's a DVT, probably two different things going on. Okay. And just to reiterate, so the DVT would be in the veins. We're talking about arteries for SCAD and FMD. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, and then a kind of a final question too is, you know, Several patients, a lot of patients do have the benefit of being in areas where we get to see doctors like you guys, um, but for patients who don't, who don't have um, you know, the team like you all, what sort of specialist do these patients, what sort of team do these patients need to have or get together in order to manage SCAD, FMD, dissections, all these different vascular problems? I can start with that, I guess. Um, so I think it's going to depend on um, your areas of involvement and your symptoms. Um, so for example, if you're a patient who's had um, a carotid dissection and you have fibromuscular dysplasia, um, depending on your symptoms with that, seeing a neurologist and or cardiovascular specialist may be appropriate. Um, but I will say that I think even more important probably than, than the exact specialist is whether or not you're seeing a provider who is willing to learn and have a conversation with you. Um, so, you know, if, if you have that rapport with your doctor um, and even if they don't have the resources locally, they're, they're willing to, to learn from you and read what you bring to them. I think that's a great indicator that you have a great physician. Absolutely. I know I've definitely found that to be true as a patient too, finding the providers that you feel comfortable talking to and who are able to, who have the resources to be able to coordinate um, regardless of what their specialty on paper says or on the computer. Um, and I, I did, I, I know I said that was the last question, but I had one more. Um, but for patients who have had SCAD, it's kind of a general overarching question of who should be screened or evaluated for FMD or other arterial diseases. I'll take that one since it goes right back to where we started. So I think you did that on purpose, Rebecca. Um, I think anybody who has a SCAD heart attack should really discuss with their doctor about getting cross-sectional imaging that is CTA or MRA from head to pelvis. Um, and this is not to diagnose FMD. Um, that right now, uh, like as, to, as Dr. Katie and Dodov said, you know, the treatments are the same. What we are concerned about are these aneurysms that, you know, and aneurysms are, are funny like that. They, they're, they're there and then they don't cause problems until they do. And so the, the point of early diagnosis is to prevent a bad outcome, such as a brain aneurysm rupture or, or you know, a kidney infarction or something like this. And so the point is to look for vascular abnormalities that need closer surveillance from year to year. If you're a person who've had a, who's had a CAT scan from head to pelvis and, not, and they found nothing um, that needs follow-up, you really don't need imaging over and over again, but that's not the case for everybody. So I would say everybody um, should have a head to pelvis screen um, at least one time. Um, and that is supported by the international consensus on the treatment of patients with FMD, as well as both the American and the European consensus statements uh, for SCAD. And you can tell your doctors that if they don't believe you. Wonderful, thank you. And those um, statements are available on our website, the scadalliance.org. Um, too, if you want to see copies of those or go through some of the details of that um, these doctors today have talked about. Um, so with that, I'm going to go ahead and wrap up. This is our fifth Ask the Experts, um, a conversation hosted by SCAD Alliance. I really appreciate all three of you um, for, joint, for speaking with us today. This is always really informative and re really empowering. Um, we've mentioned iSCAD registry a couple of times, and I just want to mention that um, you, are, you can find more information about that on our website at scadalliance.org. So also, if um, you're interested or looking into being a patient or registering for that, 
um, you can check out at clinicaltrials.gov and see if one of the, see if there's a site near you at this time. We're continuing to enroll sites. So hopefully if there's not one close to you at this time, hopefully there will be soon. Um, but that's where you can get the information for that. Um, also a YouTube link to the recording for this will be posted on all our social media pages and emailed to our listserv. Um, and you can sign up for that again at our website, scottalliance.org. And we will see you, we'll be back in November with our next topic and Ask the Experts. And this concludes today. Thank you guys so much for joining us. Bye. Thank you.